Hi, everybody, and welcome to our final fireside chat for inclusive classroom strategies. So, yes, this is going to be the Module 6 and Module 7 fireside chat combined. There really isn't any need to do a Module 7 fireside chat because for Module 7, you will be working exclusively on your ta -da -da, ta -da, Bill Porter plan. So let's get into this. Um, I do have six pages today, and uh, almost all of these are shout-outs, and I want to make sure I get to them and go through this pretty quickly to respect your time. Super busy um, uh, part of the year we have right now with, with uh, getting ready for Thanksgiving and, and uh, winter vacation coming up, so let's get into it. Um, universal Design for Learning. Hey, what, you know, what a module that was. And I really appreciate it, again, um, looking at that from the perspective of the student, that the student has divergent ways to demonstrate learning, divergent ways to demonstrate learning, um, whether that be through like a, you know, a written, um, some kind of written work, a PowerPoint, whether they're doing like a podcast or they, they do a video, whatever it is, divergent ways to demonstrate learning. Um, so, so important. And we have the trombone player want it video with marcus buckingham playing to your strengths just a reminder that you know again a student comes home with a report card and they have three a's um two b's and a d so what are the parents going to do if they look at this where are they going to place the emphasis it's going to be on the d like we got to get the d better like that's got to be a c or b so um and what we overlook is we overlook what about the A's and the B's, the strength areas, and and we kind of just do this in general, you know, with our with ourselves. Like I'm, you know, I'm stronger at this, I'm not as strong as this, and and so I think we try to get our weaknesses up to somewhat, you know, of a level that we can manage them, um, but we do not want to give up our strengths in order to lift our our weaknesses because then what we do is we just bring ourselves down to to average. And it's, we all are, have strengths that give us unique capabilities to do things. So um, just it's a really neat video, and it's something we, we all tend to get lost in, especially as educators, um, is to look at maybe that, that one area that just isn't clicking for that student. And, and the, there, I mean, you can use now technology and other supports. And, you know, for example, like I, I don't type very well, so I can do some um, – I can I can do some productive text uh, typing software. I can do um, speech to text, so I have I have those available to me. I put a lot of things into like bullet points and and just kind of notations. I actually um, like for professional work that I I I do, um, you know, as a legal consultant and, and things like that, and a company that I I consult with. Um, I'll have some things just professionally transcribed. I mean. It's it, it's just some I'll I'll have it recorded and then I zip it off to my transcriber and you know it's part of the contract that you know whoever I'm working with and and that person transcribes it and gets it back to me and boom you know we're all we're all set so um, it's just much more cost effective it's quicker to do things that way and to let me stay in the flow and and, and do the the work that I need to do um, so that just that's just the way it works for me. Um, one of the things I want to talk about real quickly is subjective reality. And I do a, a podcast on, on, I did a podcast on this in my safety doc podcast. If you're following, you can, you can still follow, you can, you can get in. I think there's a link up above. Um, every week I do a podcast, the safety doc podcast airs on the 405 media out of Los Angeles, California, but subjective reality. So let's say we have, um, a hundred students outside. And and you you have um, students look at a car in the parking lot, and you ask a question of what color is that car? Ninety nine students say that's a red car. That's a red car. And you're like, yeah, it's a red car. And one student's like, whoa, 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 like that's a green car. And you're like, whoa, whoa, oh, whoa, Timmy, 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 car right there. That's a red car. Tim's like, no, it's a red, it's a green car. Um, is 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 Tim making this up? Is Tim trying to be difficult? No. What Tim processes through his eyes his rods and cones whatever filters he has going on in his neural network he's seeing that car authentically is green so that's sometimes too is we 
need to understand how students are perceiving um, the information that's coming in to them. And also, like with Bill, like it might take more wait time for, for information to get through into Bill's systems. And also, subjectively, like Bill probably hasn't had a lot of experience tactily with input of, of things and even like knowing his body in space. I mean, like he probably hasn't been, you know, doing like a lot of playground stuff growing up and things like that. So these are all subjective things like um, that are going to be different for Bill than than probably for a lot of his his peers. Um, so it's just very interesting. It, it, it's a pretty cool presentation on subjective reality if you're interested. If not, don't worry about it. So the Bill Porter plan, that's what we're focused on right now. We are into um, our wrap-up mode. On December 8th, you need everything into me. I need all of your any posts that you haven't had in, you can check your your grade book and you can you know you know type in see what posts you've made, what posts you haven't on a search, um, just in, in in Moodle. But make sure you have everything in, and the Bill Porter plan has to be in on the eighth, Friday, December eighth. And I have a very short window, a couple of days to turn around, get it back to you, grade it, and there'll be very explicit. Um, instructions for you on how to obtain it's hand graded i go through and i you know I, I take a pen and i grade it and has your grade at the end with a rubric and stuff like that of all the grades entered things like that um but you need to make sure everything is in you can submit it ahead of time that's fine you know it's not like i grade it though and return it to you and say change this but you can you can do it ahead of time but everything has to be in on the eighth absolutely has to be in so most of you in pretty good shape a couple of you though you know still you know make sure you have everything to done has to be it. okay bill porter plan should be fun it should be a narrative um make sure you're spending time right now doing your due diligence going in checking out what is available in your um you know community for bill like park and rec making sure you're you're doing some searches for like technology for children with cerebral palsy or you're talking to people and not again all this will apply for bill but it's like here are things like we might want to consider or here are some books my librarian recommended about um, cerebral palsy like bill's a, a fourth grader so here's like taking cp to school so this is a book we're going to read in class and and talk about cp or um you know we're, we're going to do um I, I, just recently it was it was last week actually last friday i participated in an exercise where i was i was blindfolded and i was required then to go through a lunch um, and create a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and just on verbal directions and, and then, of course, all of the kind of other distractions, the background noise going on, um, guide it to a table, have to pull out a chair, um, having to open yogurt, like, you know, just by feeling where everything is and feeling where the spoon is. But, um, you know, that was an activity, a simulation activity to help bring awareness and the and those things are, are are kind of tricky because some people be like, well, like if you have somebody in a wheelchair for five minutes and and you have them wheel an obstacle course, that that actually doesn't help. I mean, it it gives them it's more it's it's more fun than anything else maybe, um, and and they don't get a feel for you know if you're in that chair every day for so many hours of it gets sore and your back gets sore and things. But I this was very well done. And I thought this was very helpful because afterwards we, we talked about it as a staff. And, it, and the points were, you know, always tell people who you are when you approach them, if they're, if they're visually impaired, um, if they're you know, blind. And, and then also, you know, use, use clock directions on, okay, this is at 4 o'clock, this is at noon, this is at 2 o'clock. And, and making sure then that before you physically contact someone, like, you know, on a shoulder to help them move to a place where they should, you know, should sit, that you let them know, I'm going to put my hand on, on your shoulder and, and help you get to an area where you can sit down. And then, you know, any, any other questions? And, and then, you know, not that you're enabling, but those types of things. I'm like, oh, yeah, like how many times do we just assume um, – you know, I'm going to help you over here or whatever instead of like, you know, we're going to, to walk to your left and we're going to walk, 
you know, we're, we're, we're going to go for about 10 feet, and then here are some of the people who are going to be sitting around you and stuff like that. So it, it was very helpful, very helpful. So the Bill Porter plan, yeah, and check with your local parks and recs what's available. Someone once wrote, and I thought this was really cool. They, this was done once. Someone wrote, like, Bill Bill was a sophomore is, is how they portrayed Bill. And they said, we are going to uh, connect Bill up with um, a local vendor for um, farmer's market because Bill has an interest in business. And he's going to be going to this farmer's market then, um, you know, and, you know, like with his mom. And and they're going to partner up with this this farmer and do maybe like three, four times. And then Bill's going to get to interact with the public. He's going to get to know how this farmer, you know, sets up the, the stand and, and how processes money and just like an early business feel. And it was really cool. Like nobody came up with that idea before, so I, I just thought it was kind of neat. So, so think of things like that. Um, and and again, there really is there is not a, a wrong way to do this. One thing I will say though, and I'm, I'm going to put this out there right now, is is speech to text, where like Bill would dictate and then the computer would transcribe. That probably isn't going to work because Bill is dysarthric. And Dragon Naturally Speaking software and other software programs probably aren't going to work. So do not write um, because, I mean, I was, everybody will write this. And, and do not write, uh, we will use um, speech to text software for, for Bill if, so Bill can dictate his assignments. That's not going to work. Bill can use predictive text, like he can start to type words and it will like come up with, with suggestions. Um, you know, so, so, you know, like that, that's an option. And, and they even have things now, like, you know, if Bill has his own personal device, like an iPad, like as a teacher talks, it can start to record the notes and like actually take that speech to text, you know, like the teacher or like a partner or something like that, that he's working with. So, and, and, and be careful too of the aid time you're allocating to Bill because Bill's a pretty independent guy. So you don't want to um, take that independence away. Let us talk now dun, 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 dun. shout outs yay shout outs okay um selena selena you wrote authentic learning is demonstrated through the skills that students learn when being taught through these practices i found that as a student myself it was way easier to learn new concepts when i could connect them to things i have already learned and had prior knowledge connecting to um Awesome. Awesome. I'm glad you pointed out assumptions we tend to make about students' background knowledge, whether it's like an individual student, like, yeah, that student, obviously, you know, they took a vacation. So we're going to talk about, like, you know, what are things like places you might want to go on a vacation and stuff like that? And then the student could build like a, a brochure around it so they could research the area. And, the dis and it, it could be like one student could be like, I've never taken a vacation. Like, we've never done a vacation. So, like, what, what are you kind of talking about? Um, or you could have multiple students in, in that. So it's one of those things of, of asking for that background knowledge. And this, this was something that sticks with me to this day. I was finishing up my um, teaching licensure program, so like 25 years ago, it's, it's UWSP, students point. And in summer, I had a stats class. And um, it, was, it was designed for teachers. I forget the name of the prof. Guy was excellent, though. Guy was excellent. And one of the things he did is he gave all of us um, like 20, 20 papers and and they were multiple choice and they had been, so it was like a, you know, a unit on something. And and then we would have to go through as a, as a group and look at this and then kind of talk about what we learned from these, these graded papers. And it, he designed these so, you know, it was obvious, it was, it was stuck out. It'd be like, hey, you know, um, every, everybody except like two students missed number eight and look at number, you know, um, 17, 18 and 19, like 50% of the students missed those. And those all had to do with like forming opinions or something like that. So the point he was making was you need to do item analysis. You need to go in and, and say, you know, if a, if a large number of students kind of missed something, one, they either didn't have the background knowledge in it innately the background knowledge, you know, so you kind of skipped over it just thinking they're going to know this, so you don't have to teach it. Or, you know, when you taught it, you weren't asking content questions that, that the students were understanding it. So his suggestion was, like, throw those out. Like, don't penalize a student for, for those. 
Um, but make sure you come back then and and teach those those areas that you explicitly cover those areas. And he said you'll get better with this as time goes on, um, especially if you're working with three or four teachers, like in a professional learning community type thing. And you know, back I don't know if PLC was the term back then, but basically saying, you know, if you are all delivering the same like kind of unit exams, you can get together and look at those, and and you can figure out the areas where you're going to need to spend more emphasis. Um, because you know students are are, are getting those go, those areas wrong, um, so it, I still value em, item analysis so much based upon that class. And I remember leaving that class, and you said one of the best things you can do as a teacher is to take the time for item analysis on your common assessments. So, Lisa K, Lisa K, I appreciate it. Your UDL PowerPoint, love the fall colors. Um, in, in it, you include it. In UDL, teachers should provide multiple means of representation, such as YouTube clips, audio, books, visual aids, handouts, etc., to make the information accessible to all students. I think it's great. I think it's great you include it. YouTube, it's new, and a lot of people, a lot of teachers, they still kind of don't embrace that. Um, YouTube clips provide context, and it's also a quick way to teach students um, how to get like a demonstration of something. I got my my previous cell phone, the battery, um, the, the little plastic thing that went over and protected where the, the, the charger went in, that broke off. And it, it broke off a few times and I had to order like replacement parts on Amazon, they're super cheap. But the thing was they were like real tricky to get in, on, like to install it. So I went on YouTube and I'm like installing whatever on a Galaxy phone and boom, like, uh, 10, 15 videos come up and it's like, hey, I had this trouble and you probably have this trouble too. So in two minutes, I'm going to show you how to do it. And boom, it was like I learned how to do it. A friend of mine learned how to change the oil on his um, motorcycle like by, by watching a video on YouTube. So we can use that with students, but think about it with cerebral palsy and Bill coming to school. If you want to do a little kind of um, prep lesson with staff on, on cerebral palsy, you could find a video that's two, three minutes long. I mean, you could find a video. You could have, create a video of Bill, too, or have Mom do that. Um, but let's say you could find a video and say, like, this isn't Bill, but this is a student about Bill's age at SCP, and not that, you know, this means this is exactly how Bill will present. But um, it, it then provides an instant context. That's a person. People can asso associate with that. It's much different than just sitting in front of people and, giving them handouts like here's here's eight handouts on cerebral palsy and here's like 14 websites you can go to don't do that ever don't do that um but like here's this two or three minute video and then we're going to talk about it and, and you know ask questions like what what did you think and you know and, and someone would be like so if you have cerebral palsy like do, do you have normal intelligence and, and the answer to that is yes like in most cases people have normal intelligence so they deserve academic rigor um and we need to make sure too that that peers um give that student ample wait time to give a response because the student can generate that they they do have the means um of of intellect to do that so um I, i'm just glad you included that and i i think youtube offers so many things we can use for professional development allison allison for your scavenger hunt you wrote However, this is rare as we are always so short staffed, kind of framing this around co teaching. I also observed a rural district and found co teaching to be minimal, if not non existent. I think this may be due to lack of funding or lack of employees. So one of the things is I'm not sure I'm I'm sold on the causation of lack of funding um, causing lack of co teaching. I might be there if we're saying like that it's due to a lack of professional development or with 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 teachers of, or that we have a lack of of common planning time because we're trying to squeeze as much into every single minute that we can of of the school day so we're, we're not really trying to get orig, original with schedules like block sch scheduling stuff like that um so i'm not sure like that causation that might be more relational those two things like just might be happening um but it is one of those things, though. It is it. it, it you need staff to definitely do co-teaching, um, and if you do have smaller schools, it, sometimes it can be harder. Sometimes it can be easier, though. If everybody's like in a K-12 building, sometimes it can be easier um, to do some co-teaching, especially you know if you have a special education 
teacher who might be split across buildings in another district, but if you have like one K-12 building, it's easier to get into the different classrooms. So, um, but get, get this, I know, I know a, a school district in Wisconsin where the superintendent is also the principal and he's also a school counselor. So yeah, when you, when you wear those many hats, it, it's really hard to, to do co-teaching. Um, you mentioned partnering with outside agencies such as uh, Catholic Charities. I, I think that's awesome. I've seen that done with success. Um, and I also think we underutilize distance learning. Distance learning labs were huge like 10 years ago. And, and the technology to put together a distance learning lab is pretty inexpensive. But I don't know why we just don't do more of that. So let's say we have three small rural districts and we have one teacher who teaches Spanish or something. Um, why that teacher can't be doing some of this through distance learning and then maybe visiting some of these other districts. Now, I understand that's not real desirable. So like that teacher is probably going to be like, if I can get in a permanent position in a, in one district, that's what I'm going to do. But um I, I just think there's opportunities for distance learning that we're not taking advantage of. So that's another another opportunity to go in there. Um, Mitchell, Mitchell, first, thank you for the birthday shout out. Na 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 na. You said it's my birthday. Na 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 na. It really was my birthday. So in your UDL PowerPoint, you include it. Provide multiple means of action and expression. And then you had planning and performing tasks is kind of a heading and underneath that. How we organize and express our ideas, writing an essay or solving a math problem, our strategic task. Yes. And you cite it at the National Center on Universal Design for Learning. I, I think um, this is where we see a massive expansion in, in education. And, and that's specifically how students express their understanding, that they are allowed to be divergent, um, uh, have divergent expression. So... It's it, to show that they, they know this, but it can be in many, many different ways. Um, so I think that's where we're starting to, to have this explosion in a good way in education. Um, I, I'm seeing students who are creating video documentaries and students who are, so so they'll do that. And, and then they'll, you think about it though, let's break it down. They have to do research. So they have to get in and they have to research the topic. They have to learn interview skills. They have to develop a script and, and you know, and, and outlining. They have to learn verbal presentation techniques. They have to evaluate their own work, you know, is the audio, video, you know, loud enough. Um, by the way, I, I did turn the, the mic up a little bit, so I hope this isn't blasting anyone out just for the fact that I'm not going to go in and do a post-edit on audio on this. Um, they have to learn editing, self-evaluation, hardware, software, technology skills. So, man, there's all this stuff that goes into it. Wow. So um, it's weird, though, because more teachers are accepting things like that, but not everybody. I had a student of that I worked with um, who last year went to college and in her first year wanted to do a, a video presentation. It was about diversity, and she was going to do a video presentation about being visually impaired as um, an area of, of diversity and really had it laid out well. But the teacher was like, okay, what you're presenting, like I, I like all this content, but I, I want this in a written form. So <laughs> you can't do this in a video format. And the student's like, well, why not? Like then, you know, I could share this video. I could, I could publish it. There could be discussion threads that go with it and things. And the teacher's like, nope, because this is just the way I accept it. It has to, everybody has to do it like the same way. It's like, um, what was it? Frank Burns and Nash. Individual, individuality is fine as long as we all do it together. So, um, which didn't make any sense. Dustin, you wrote the second best practice. Okay. The second best practice I relate it with is that of the extended block scheduling. This has proven to be very useful for those in the science field where you can conduct those lab experiments from start to finish with those 80-minute classes rather than trying to divide them into two 45-minute um, class periods. It's just not possible to cover that material in such short time. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm with you. First of all, I think having more time, especially with, student, with students with disabilities who have more, sometimes more processing time that they need, the, the longer time provided in block scheduling does, does help. Um, during my administrative licensure program up at UW Superior, um, it was a wild, wild summer living in the dorm up there, and they were putting in uh, cable 
cable to go through into the dorms for the internet what ether cable that's you know it's all wireless now but so like you'd literally come back from class and there'd be like this fine concrete dust covering your your bed and your pillowcase and your laptop thankfully if you'd close it you'd be okay but um, they actually gave us the summer for free um, after having to go through that and uh, anyway we had, we had one person up there who was like the the guru of of block scheduling and and he taught us how to do block scheduling it, it was another it, it was another stat as a principal he was going for like a superintendent license and he's like here's how to block schedule for more common planning time like at an elementary school at a middle school high school and so we used to get together in the lobby at night and and he, this guy would just like whip up all of these different designs and and share them and say like here's a model here's a model what do you have now and all this stuff so changing is, is so yeah block scheduling i have found lends itself better to common planning time and professional learning community time which supports co-teaching that's kind of my experiences but i i pretty much seen that universally um but changing a schedule as we know is is tough it's kind of like uh pulling pulling teeth and you really have to have a ded- dedicated um administrative team and people who are buying into it to get that that change to happen um and a lot of times you'll get a schedule change and people will be like, this is great. Like, I'm, I can't believe we didn't do this forever. So, Justin, Justin, you wrote, I think creating buy-in requires breaking down the walls between modern-day readers and, and so-called books from the past. Books tend to change, meaning over time as readers change. For example, Heart of Darkness was read very differently 50 years ago than it is today. Previously, readers generally focused on the novel as a meditation on the potential for madness inhumanity and savagery that is inside each person today more focus is placed on the implications that africa and the african people in the novel serve as symbols for the madness inhumanity and savagery a big challenge with older texts is the language they are written in if students are given the tools to get beyond that and are allowed to work in a place where their responses to the text, including their criticism, you're right. We got that's the part. We can criticize things. We can say like, I think I, I think they, the author was off on this, like or, or or this positioning. That that's okay. That critical thinking is good. Um, and this is how I probably would have I would have framed it. I actually do that with some J.K. Rowling books. You know, I'm like, well, here's here's a part that that's really not didn't get developed as much like i love the book don't get me wrong and all this other stuff but i don't understand like why this this was kind of lingering or you know there's even like tv shows things like that um okay i i think they will have better relationships with the text even if they don't um leave the class wanting to go and read more classics in their free time if students are given the tools to wade through shakespeare's difficult language for example they are allowed access to shakespeare's saucy humor and the more relatable universal elements of his plays that still resonate, res, uh, resonate today, especially those high school-related themes in Othello, which is the play I wrote about for the thesis. So um, those, are, those are great points. And I was in my uh, 40s. I was in my 40s uh, when I really understood Hamlet. I, I listened to Dr. T- Duke Pesta. You can look this up, P-E-S-T-A, Dr. T- Duke Pesta, out of University of Wisconsin, Oshkosh. Um, and he covers uh, Shakespeare and literature. He is phenomenal. You can go online and just type in Dr. Duke Pesta plus, like, Hamlet plus presentation, and he gives this presentation on Free Domain Radio, I think, in the last year. It's about an hour, hour and a half long. It's riveting. He's a dynamic presenter. But he, he talked about talks about Hamlet, and for the first time, like I remember Hamlet is like oh yeah whatever. But he talks he relates it to the context of when it was written. You know, like literally like whistling through the graveyard was just a way at the time when Hamlet was written. You know, when Shakespeare wrote that of there was there were so many symbols of death all around. You know, like it was just ornate ornate like things were decorated with skulls and stuff like that because. Um, it was better to face fear directly, you know, and, and mortality directly so you could deal with it. So you you literally would just whistle through the, the graveyard. Um, but, he, you know, he talked about then, you know, taking ha- Hamlet and and how Shakespeare, you know, to be or, or not to be. And, and the question there was, um, 
you know, the the to be would be to to keep living, and the not to be was if if he died or took his own life, would he just go into this eternal basic sleep type mode, and and was was so was life kind of pointless. Um, but we we know then, you know, like he says, well, we know actually though, like um, Shakespeare was very passionate about life and and loved life and wanted to be remembered, and through all of his works. That's really his way of living on. So he was really all about to be. So the to be or not to be wasn't even so much of a question. Um, but he talks about today, you know, the challenges that that face people today, like face, um, you know, leaders and and just the the fact of when we're faced with our with our own issues of mortality and and what is our legacy on on life kind of that hold to be or not to be and and again bringing it into a modern context so um i i thought it was phenomenal i i'm not doing it justice but i it again dr duke pesta university of wisconsin oshkosh and if you just do like hamlet plus free domain radio you'll find that podcast it's free um it, it it's excellent so um and you talk about time. Timing is everything. I did a I did a podcast actually a few weeks ago with another podcaster out of Dallas, Texas, and we were talking about the timing of podcasting that contains humor. Because some of my, I mean, I, I podcast about safety, but I also have some humor in some of my podcasts. It's part of my personality. But I did a podcast um, that it, I interviewed a lady um, from the Cajun Navy, Cajun Navy Relief, and we had some humor within the interview. And and although I mean she she is this phenomenal es- effort of, of of courting these rescues and stuff, but as I got re- prepared to release this, I released it, and literally twelve hours later, the Vegas shooting happened. So my whole process of kind of promoting this and all of this, it, it got really hard because the context when something happens, you have to look at the context of like as you're talking about Othello and, and things like that of and and of heart of darkness like when that was written what was the context when that was written but we tend to judge things in the context of like right now so you know even like banning books like we have to ban this book because it it you know has has these innuendos or whatever in it in the current context and it's like yeah i don't know i mean because if we look at the context of when this was written you know, it helps us to understand that time and how things were perceived. And if we keep benchmarking things to the present modern day context, we we just start to forget the the past or scrub the past. And maybe there's times to do that. Maybe there's times not to do that. But but I, I you really brought forward some deep deep um, deep discussion here, Justin. I appreciate it. Brendan, Brendan, from your scavenger hunt, you wrote my observations of this are mixed. To be completely honest. The reason being is I don't think the students are accustomed to the teaching style of, of you know, of co-teaching. To the students, I think it feels a little strange. That's much just my opinion. I don't have any research to back this up. Um, I, you know, thanks thanks for framing that out. And actually, I mean, if I, I'm thinking, yeah, I mean, if I'm in a classroom and co-teaching is happening and I haven't experienced it before, unless it's explained to me, I'm kind of like, what's the deal with this? Like, I'm always used to, like, the one-teacher format. Now we have the two teachers in here, or teacher or teacher assistant, or what is this? So, yeah, I think it does create an awkward situation if it's if it's something that the students aren't educated about. And also, like, if it's the only class where it's happening, it's like, what's the deal? Like, why is this happening for us and not happening for others? So I think it can be a very unusual experience, and I think that's where you need to um, – spend time telling the students this is this is how this class will be instructed and we didn't really cover that too much in the class you brought up in your question which is a great point to to remind us of if we are using a co-teaching model parallel teaching you know whatever that we explain like this is what this is the way we are structuring this to instruct you and like both of us are considered you know if you have a question you can raise your hand either of us our teachers will answer this um, or this teacher is going to primarily, you know, be helping with some of the vocabulary. And this is what I'm going to do. And but it, but it's good because, yeah, I mean, like traditionally, this is not the setup that we use. So, Jared, you wrote, students don't walk into an English classroom and say, "I can't wait to expand my vocabulary and reasoning skills today." 
They walk in long-faced because they have to read Shakespeare or Hawthorne or Austin, books that seem to be relics of the past written in an elevated vernacular and seemingly boring at first glance. By the way, I did use the word vernacular last week with a peer. He was like, whoa, vernacular. I'm like, gotcha. Um, especially for kids who are mere novices in literary criticism, history, and literary devices. Um, I, I, and we just kind of talked about this a, a little bit before with, um, with, with Justin, but you're right on. And this is where I would go and, and say like that Dr. Duke Pesta lecture from UW Oshkosh. Things are out there. And I think maybe, maybe it's because, I don't know, podcast or some of the YouTube videos are bringing some of these, these things into more of a contemporary context. And I think you can allow students to, you know, we we do see all of these these kooky things like the modern interpretation of Romeo and Juliet, and I don't know. I think there's some value in that, and and sometimes I I think it's it's just it, it gets a little too removed from from what the intent really is. But um, again, you have to be ready for this stuff too, and sometimes you're just not ready when you're in going into high school English. Like, honestly, I wouldn't have been ready for any of that. And I wasn't, I never really pulled much out of it. I didn't understand much of, you know, well, Shakespeare, for example, but once I learned, you know, it was a King Arthur and then Hamlet and, 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 and really learned it from the perspectives of, um, again, you know, what Dr. Duke Pesta had, had presented and, and the deep messages and, and how that threads into modern things that are that are happening. And I'm just, I guess I'm, I'm more, I, I don't know if I'm more intellectual, I'm just more prepared for it now. I crave it more. Um, so sometimes I think it's just one of those things too, is we have to realize with some of this, um, some students might be interested in some parts of it and, and not others. And we, we introduce things to people and yet like it might be something later in life that becomes the acquired taste for them. Um, and that's hard when like, this is like what you're required to do. Like this class teaches whatever. Um, so I think it's a matter of, of exposing and finding out, you know, what they like, what they can, what they can relate to. But yeah, there are, there are so many things or books that I have read, um, now that I would have never really had much interest in when I was younger. Although it was kind of weird. Like I remember the Wisconsin blue book. I would read that every year when it came out, I'd be like 10, 11 years old. And, and they had one edition where they had maybe like 15 pages on when the Capitol burned down and they had pictures of it and stuff like that, you know, in Wisconsin, it was, I don't know, 1910 or something like that. Um, they just varnished and caught on fire. And I was just fascinated by, by that. Um, so, I mean, I did have these, these splinter parts of, of history. So, but yeah, I, I, I think sometimes it's, and I think maybe, I don't know. I don't know. This brings up a good point, Jared. I mean, is, is it telling people, um, telling kids, I don't know, kids, I mean, telling students, we're talking about high school, like this might not be very interesting to you now, but at some point you might find this more interesting. It's just like music too. I mean, <laughs> my taste for music has changed considerably over the years from D Snyder and Twisted Sister. Although I, I guess I, that's probably not a great example because I still love that song. Um, but I don't listen to that type of stuff as much as going back more even into to classical type music, um, um, even folk music. I really, I really tend to, to like, um, I like Irish music. So, um, yeah, I think it's called the high Kings. Like I listen to a lot of their, their stuff. So, um, but yeah, thanks. Thanks for, thanks for pointing that, that out. Rebecca, regarding best practices, Rebecca wrote, I also like the integration of teaching responsibility and peacemaking in the curriculum. These are important into um, making a healthy classroom community. It seems natural that life skills such as these should be included in the classroom so students can patrol and correct themselves rather than being perpetually controlled and corrected by the teacher. Yeah, this reminds me a ton of um, when I... In, in one of my first teaching experiences across the hall from me was a 4k teacher and she had a rule she was a great teacher but she had a rule 
with her students, and it was ask three before you ask me. Ask three before you ask me. So they would have to go to three others of, of their peers and, and ask them a question, you know, the question that they were going to ask the teacher. And if they didn't get the answer that they, they need it, then they could come to the teacher. But the teacher would say, who are the three that you asked? And she would she would check. And usually they could, you know, get the assistance from, from their peers. Um, and But you're talking here, you know, also about teaching um, peacemaking in the curriculum. And I think when we, we get to peacemaking, I'm going to change that a little bit here and t- take this narrative in a different direction. And let's take it from peacemaking to teaching debate. We used to teach debate in schools well into the 60s and 70s. And it was even on TV. Like you'd have the debate teams. We had this in my high school. Like the debate team would would compete against another debate team and it would be on, you know, like, you know, whatever, Sunday night at 6 o'clock or something like that. And, and those things just went away. Like we don't even teach debate anymore. And, and debate goes, you know, all the way back to ancient Greece. And the key to debate is understanding um, the other person's perspective and trying to understand their, I guess, argument or their position as well as they do. So you can say, like, I understand these are your points and why you've made these points. This, this is how I understand it. And these are my points, and, and here's why, you know, then you can make your persuasive argument. And and you can leave these discussions then of of trying to you know of, of saying, I guess I don't agree with your position, um, you know, other person, but I but I'm going to respect it as long as we agree to the non-aggression principle. It's not like okay, I don't agree with your permission, so then that other person starts hitting you or something like that. Well, that's not acceptable. You know, you have a right to defend yourself, and it's you know what what you say shouldn't um, you know evolve in, into you know personal harm or stuff like that, but. But yeah, you you brought up something very dear to me, and that's the art of debate, which has been been lost. And I I brought that back with students that I work with, and teaching some of the fundamentals of debate because I, it helps with perspective taking, and then I think it helps with working out differences, and eventually gets to what that 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 type of peacemaking is. Because um, peacemaking to me, I think, kind of implies like something's broken and you have to fix it, and debate is more like it's um. It, your information or your understanding is incomplete. So you're teaching people specifically how to get a more complete understanding. Let us move on. All right. Okay. We are, I, I'm going through this um, fast, folks, just because, you know, I want to respect your, your time and what, what you have is, is very important. Kelly, Kelly, you wrote partner learning. I think we undervalue the benefit of partner learning as a best practice. When we inspire and encourage students to work together, we will likely see a lot of success. I think you're right on. I think the YouTube videos with UDL included segments of students explaining concepts to other students, especially if it's like if they're at a group and there's maybe, um, you know how they set the desk, like two desks facing two desks, there's like four so the, the students go through something, and then the teacher is like, okay, like, explain it now to the other students you know, that you're working with. And students feel safe doing that. And, and we learn by teaching others. We know that. Um, so, yeah, I think partner learning is, is awesome. Um, and it's so much better. And I still, rem- I still remember being in elementary school, third grade, and being called to the chalkboard back then to solve some problem that I had no idea how to solve. So I'm standing up there, and I'm like, just like oh no and i felt nervous and i to this day i I still remember it i still remember where my desk was i remember being called up and then the teacher too was like well come on you know this we went through this like whatever or this is you know what to do and i'm like i'm just me waiting up here isn't going to bring the knowledge into my mind of what the next step is um but had i been working with a small group of students around me you know that we would have been working on some things and and then you know, that I could have demonstrated to them, I would have felt very comfortable with that. And then even as a group, like the four of us, maybe if we could have been, if the teacher would have called and said, okay, you know, the the four of you, um, I I would like you to come up to the, the board as a group and, and walk us through this this problem. That'd be awesome. So, or even if it's two, you know, two people. So, um so yeah, thanks thanks for bringing that up, and 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 now I have this this horrible memory. Although like the teacher was pretty cool overall in that class, um, and uh, it was really weird because it, it was a 
like a four story building. I think I talked about it early on, like once it was really old school. And and the windows would open all the way up and there were no screens and then like I mean, literally, I mean they were only you could just you know, like balls from recess would fly right through into the windows in the classroom and splat. But it's crazy. Lisa R. Lisa R. So, um, and Lisa, I hope you've been able to get in some yoga. I definitely need to um, learn some yoga or something because, like, after I've been running lately, like, I'll go down to untie my running shoes and I'm like, oh, what else can I do when I'm down here? Because, <laughs> like, my muscles are kind of tight and sore, you know. So, um, yeah, anything I need to pick up off the floor, anything, you know, because I'm not going to be bending down to untie my shoes again. Um, you, you shared two videos about UDL and the second video, you making sense of universal design for learning. You wrote, this is a straightforward video with some great tips on making curriculum accessible to all. The video highlights four components for success. They are one learning the student's background knowledge and experience. Yes. Like knowing that background knowledge, we talked about the importance of doing that for item analysis Two, learning the student's strengths and abilities, right? We want to capitalize on strengths. Um, and, and as Marcus Bus Buckingham said, we don't want to lose track of, of those and continuing to push those, keep them strong and get them even stronger. Learning the students' preferences. Yeah, what, what's a learning style? I mean, some students are going to be v visual, auditory, and, and things like that. We tend to present almost everything visual because we know about 8% of, of learning occurs, you know, visually. But um, two, or do students like um, to, to kind of work alone, work at their own pace, use, use graphic organizers, you know, all, all different types of things. Um, number four, learning the student's personal interest. You know, that, that's, that's really big too. Like um, I, I, I think there's so much that, that comes into, if you know what that personal interest is um, and, and opening that up is a way for them to demonstrate divergent learning. So I think the key points here that you, you indicate, one is strengths, that we, we recognize strengths and we keep fueling the fire for those strengths um, and not that, that we capitulate those strengths to try to bring up weaknesses, like divert energy. And also interest, knowing the interest. Like my, my oldest daughter is, is a mine, loves Minecraft and like will write, um, will take entire um, three ring binders and fill them up with like directions on how to do different Minecraft things. And then she designs them out and stuff like that. I mean, it's just absolutely phenomenal, but, uh, she can do that in, and relate that into classroom things. I mean, she can, um, apply all of that in, in math and science and, and everything into that, um, and making her own little videos and stuff like that. It's really cool. So, um, I, oh, here's a story. So learning personal interests. I once helped, and this was a couple of years ago, I helped a high school student um, who had some disfluency or stuttering. Um, high school student, so, you know, like a senior. And he was into rap music. He would write his own raps. And I mean, the guy would write books of, of rap, raps, like pages and pages. And he would then, you know, rap out at a certain beat. And then uh, basically... This is the way that we practiced uh, fluency because it was it was a really great way to work on on stuttering, and I said okay, like we can work on things this way, and he put it he did a lot of research like he knew like the major rappers and he knew like the different beat sequences and things like this, um, and so I would say okay here are some words like th and w like. Um, he would he would say like with instead of with so i'm like okay tr try to incorporate some of these words and we come up with them like you know into your raps and and things like that and once he would rap like he was almost perfectly fluent and there's a guy uh scat man john i think there's a uh, there's videos out there the scat man same thing like he can sing and and kind of rap type stuff he's perfectly fluent it's pretty cool music but when he when he talks he does stutter so um we worked on this, and this was high interest. He he loved doing this. And my my thing, and and he wrote um, like a whole kind of thing about like the politics and the election, and and I'd be like, okay, our ground rules are like nothing can be threatening, and we can't have swear words, okay, <laughs> and and 
then he he wrote these raps, produced them. We recorded them. I actually took them, burned them to a CD for him. So he had like his own thing, and he made like his own pseudo record label. And then he sent um, a copy of the CD to a rap artist that he had found online. And then another teacher kind of vetted it that he was working with. And this was a rap artist who was like producing positive rap messages, everything, you know. And so he sent this thing. And this and this rapper got back to him, sent him an email and just said, you know, like, appreciate this, you know, keep up the good work and, and whatever. And, and the kid kind of like grew out of this, but it was a way like those sessions were so meaningful for him. And, and to this day, like, I mean, he's, he's significantly improved, like, um, and, and confident and and that was just something to reach out and if anyone would have ever taught me like i would be recording and helping a kid doing rap and and bring a rap cd with the kid i mean i never rap but it's kind of cool so danny danny wow i obviously understand his benefits you wrote this and the need for a, an inclusive and Movement. I struggle with the emotional wellness of those students that are still being perceived as quote unquote special. I just don't get or can't figure out how to fully alleviate that stigma for these types of students. I, I, I agree with you. Like I've said this before, like why are we using the word special and special education versus regular education? You know, we, we have these movements to try to get rid of labels, but what do we do? We add more labels like, you know, learning disability or autism or, um, you know, now in learning disability is a, is a math disability, is it this, or now we have anxiety disability and it's depression or is it bipolar and things. So I think we get to the point, and I was telling my daughters this the other, I think, I think yesterday, like they're like, wear purple today, dad, or whatever, because it's, you know, whatever, it's pancreatic cancer awareness day. And I'm like, I, you know, first of all, I, I'm not against supporting pancreatic cancer research and all these other things, but I mean, then we have the MS bucket challenge and... <clears throat> We we have this and this and this and this and it's also like World Music Day and I'm like we have too many of these things because they get lost and the meaning gets get you know we we lose the meaning and I I think here we we try to pathologize we try to give labels to these things and the DSM code the medical code um, now it's like you know actually uh, video gaming is described as a disability area for people like a video game addiction so I'm like oh my goodness. To add more labels does not solve the problem. I mean, I think we look at strengths and weaknesses and the way people learn and we get people supports. But once we start saying, like, you're this, you're this, you're this, you're this, you're this, you're this, that doesn't help. Um, and it's been kind of proven that that doesn't help. You can go in and, and do research, and, and once you label someone with something, the likelihood that they um, overcome that is, is very difficult. Um, so it, it's it, it, it just the fact that you put the label, the moment you put the label on a student um, creates this almost self-fulfilling prophecy. So, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. And there's even some schools have gone so far as like in their teacher contracts. It's no longer like special education teacher. Or regular education. It, it's like teacher, your teacher and, and signage outside of doors and stuff like that and, and directories on school websites. But you still see things like school websites. Like here's our special education teachers. You see hallways. Here's a special education hallway. Here's a door. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so, special education classroom. So, you know, we got a movie on that. Um, Allie, Allie, you wrote, using alternative ways of testing allows for students to showcase their skills in new ways and gives them more freedom to be creative. Um, I, I'm all for that. I'm all for divergent demonstration of learning. A barrier to that is time to grade assignments. So teachers say, like, I don't want students to submit like 15 different assignments to me that I have to grade and like, you know, two are videos and, you know, this is this, this is a pamphlet, whatever. Um, so I get that. I think the key to overcoming that, you know, sometimes it's saying like everybody, you do have to like, some things have to be written. Okay. Um, but like here are, here are some assignments where you can do is here's the rubric. As long as you can meet the rubric, like it's fine. And maybe the student, you know, presents it then. Um, you know, also to the, to the, the class or just presents it to you. But um, I do think it's worth, it's, it's, it's worth obviously that time investment. And the way to get around that is to have a rubric and to have exemplars of saying, here's some different ways that students spent their rubric. And over the years, you can kind of build that out. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think that's definitely a, a way, a way to go. Um, so, yeah. Um, dun, 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 
Dun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Allie. Skyler. Skyler, hey. Skyler, continue to be an active poster. Remember, you were the, you were helping us uh, science and, and, and empirical um, data backing things of saying, hey, where, where's the data to back up these statements? Keep keep throwing those things out there for us, buddy, Skyler. And we are going to wrap up here with Courtney. Courtney, in a response to Lisa, you wrote, I think the idea of using a portfolio to showcase students' work over a period of time and truly view their progress is a great way to gauge students' learning. Um, I agree with that. I think I think a portfolio of actually tangibly showing parents, like, here's what they did. And then in, this, in addition, here's what three peers did. Now, of course, you have, like, information redacted. But so... Here's what they did kind of in comparison to their peers to give the, the parents kind of a feel for some of that. That works very good at IEP meetings, and, but also like at student conferences. And um, I just think that that helps so much. And as a parent who's attended student conferences, that's helped me a lot. And I worked with um, some kindergarten teachers who did what they call pizza box portfolios. And they actually got pizza boxes from a local pizza chain and um, they would put in samples of the students' work. So it would be like, here's something that they did during, you know, the first quarter for math or for drawing or for whatever and whatever. And they would put it in their pizza box, and they would date it, and they close the box, and they'd slide it in a shelf so everything kind of fit, you know, <laughs> very orderly into the shelf. And uh, and then when they get, would get to conferences, they would open up the pizza box, and they would say, here's 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 what the student was, your your child was doing, the second week of school, and here's what they did, you know, at the tenth week of school. So we can look at the two and, and see, and, and look now. The capital letters are coming around when they should be, and not everything is capitalized. And and uh, granted, that's kind of a kindergarten example, but I do think this is really cool to do. And you can you can scan things. You can even take pictures of things. I do like little language samples, so I, I will record things and I'll save them in in files, and I can bring those out and play those for parents. Um, and it's very, very powerful when you contextualize that or little video clips. I used to do, um, when I was doing speech language in the schools, uh, for my elementary students, I, I, I did like a lesson where they they did the weather. Um, so they would go up and I would have a map of Wisconsin on a, on a wall and then they'd have some different weather stuff put on it and things like that. And they, we would, we would practice a little bit and they would basically go up and say like the, the weather today in Rhinelander or whatever. And, and so, um, it was a short clip and it was pretty standard for every, every student, but I'd be able then to do that and do that later on and, and show the difference to parents, like during an IEP meeting, like bring this up. And this was years ago. I mean, it was early technology. I mean, the big camcorder thing that the district had. Um, but literally about two minutes, you know, just say, let's watch this. So, you know, the student is looking forward more. They're using longer utterance here. I just recorded, like, you know, look, they're only saying, like, two, three words. Like, here they're using a full sentence. And, and parents will be like, oh, wow, like, I can see this now. I can I can have the comparison. Because otherwise, what are we doing? We're always benchmarking, like, to the present because we forget the past. So we take that objective past and say, here it was, here it is now. And it might not always work where it's growth from baseline in a, in a positive way it might be negative it might be like oh we had this but now we've 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 seen to lost some of these skills so we've, we've got to try to get back to where this baseline is so but normally it was there was always growth from baseline and we could demonstrate that and, that, and that's a terrific way too when we're so focused as a society on attainment is to be able to show that that growth to parents so um hey we made it under an hour here and I appreciate greatly all of your participation and your wisdom in this class. I know all of you, you know, you're, you're, you're busy. It's hard. I get it. It's hard to do a class um, while you are, for a lot of you, you're teaching or you're taking multiple classes. Um, I appreciate it. Please, 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 please get that Bill Porter plan in by December 8th. Anything else that's due, um, if you are missing things, get them in. Get them in because I cannot extend beyond the 8th for you. Um, have a happy holiday season. Have a safe travels um, for Thanksgiving. You know, the, the interstate is, um, you know, kind of all goofy right now with construction. So, like, if you haven't done a lot of interstate driving, you're going to do that. Just be really aware um, because it is it is really different um, right now. And I do drive the interstate for work, you know, most days. 
um, and, and, you know, take care of yourselves and we do have a winter break coming up and, you know, that's all going to be good. Feel free to contact me at any time with any questions or like after this class, you know, students have still contacted me, um, a year, two years out with, with something or they've asked like, Hey, you shared this in class. Now class is closed down. That's, that's one of those things too, like harvest from class documents that you want because once class is done, I think it stays up for maybe like a month and then it gets shut down. So if there are some documents you want to harvest, go in and download those documents, you know, probably over the winter break. Um, again, thank you. This is it. We will have no more fireside chats for this class. And um, uh, again, feel free to, to contact me at any point with any questions. December 8th is our deadline for getting that billboard plan in. Have a great day. Again, November 16th, 2017. Um, thank you.